Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I'm going to see if I can answer the question, why women love longer than men? And because I am a scientist, I will mainly be doing this from a scientific perspective and I thought one of the best ways to do this would be to try and relate some of these potential reasons to the hallmarks of ageing. And in particular, we'll end up focusing a little bit on nutrient signalling, a bit on mitochondria and also on information. So why have I decided to talk about why women live longer than men? Well, firstly, because let's be honest, it's quite interesting. And well, I thought it'd be interesting considering my low female watch count at the moment. But joking aside, it's interesting because if we can understand the differences between the genders, it might provide an insight into the mechanisms of ageing itself. And also it kind of raises the awareness for potential gender-specific medicine, or even personalised medicine. But also for a special reason, and this is partly because a long time ago now, well, long for me, back in 2013, I wrote an essay about why women live longer than men, and let's just say that essay did quite well, and I uh, revisited it recently, and it's quite funny, and I've contemplated about sharing it, but I'm still on the fence about it because there's some very interesting things that I write. Anyway, um, I think it's partly to blame for my interest in this topic and for pursuing biochemistry, so I have to thank the essay title writer, I suppose. Anyway, let's go on with the video. Explaining why women live longer than men is no simple task and in fact isn't something that we fully understand yet. And so there are many environmental, historical, cultural, anthropological, socio-economic and genetic factors that might be at play here. Obviously from my background I'll talk mainly about the science. But firstly just to clear the waters, I just want to reiterate that this is a general trend that women generally live longer than men and that's on average by six to eight years. And this is all data collected by the World Health Organization. And as you can see written here, life expectancy for women also varies across regions and income levels of countries. But generally this trend is seen across lifespan. However, it's not all sunshine and sprinkles for females because there's also a mortality morbidity paradox, which we'll come back to a little bit later. So I did quite a bit of research for this video and I found that there isn't actually that much literature on it. I found two reviews from 2016, both of which I've linked down in the description. But yeah, no, there wasn't that much on it, which was kind of interesting. But anyway, there's a couple of things I just want to say to set the scene. And that's firstly, obviously ageing takes a long time to study. A lifetime, in fact. <laughs> um, and my point is, is that we don't fully understand why females live longer than male males. And this isn't even really helped by the fact that we can use model organisms to try and understand the ageing process. And that's partly because humans are different to other species, including mammalian species, in the fact that gender differences in lifespan aren't unanimous. They vary depending on the species. So whilst African lions, red deer and numerous monkeys show a pattern for females to be the longer lived gender, in naked mole rats, for example, and some species of mice, they see that the males outlive the females. So it's quite complicated, and this makes studying the model organisms or using them as a model for human studies isn't as effective. But if we can understand their differences, then maybe those same differences could be applied to understanding differences in human longevity between the sexes. And also just a general caveat for using model organisms is that Often the cause of death of those organisms differs between those them and humans. For example, humans generally die, well, the most frequent causes of death in Western societies tends to be cancer and heart disease. And interestingly, studies have shown that women are less likely to succumb to most of the major causes of death. And so if you look at the top 15 causes of death in the US, 13 out of 15 of them the rate of death is higher in males than females. Interestingly, for stroke it was found to be the same, and even more interestingly, the rate was higher for women for Alzheimer's disease. And so that kind of relates back to um, this mortality morbidity hypothesis, which we will return to at some point. And this information came from this table, which is in one of the references in the description. If you can't see it on here, it's quite small, I think. Anyway, let's move on and start to discuss some of the potential reasons why women live longer than men. 
So one of the quotes I found in the review was, humans are the only species in which one sex is known to have a ubiquitous survival advantage. And well, regardless of whether the statement is actually true, the data I've shown you so far has shown that generally there is a pattern for females to live longer, so why? And so I've broken that down into different reasons. One is to do with the hormones, one is to do with nutrient signaling differences, and then there's the asymmetric inheritance arguments that are to do with both the sex chromosomes and the mitochondria and also a link to the gut microbiome. So let's start with looking at the sex hormones first. So typically men have higher levels of testosterone and females have higher levels of oestrogen. And one thing I didn't actually realise was that oestrogen, there's different multiple oestrogens. There's oestrone, oestradiol and oestriol. And besides these sex hormones knowing to have an impact on the reproductive system, there's also been studies that have shown the sex, the sex hormones have an effect on the immune response. And it's well established that men are more susceptible to many illness caused by viruses, bacteria, parasites and fungi. And unfortunately, we even have evidence from this most recent pandemic to support that. And so why is that the case and why is it related to hormones? Well, part of that is potentially due to the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties of oestrogen. And so there's been several studies that support this. One in particular is they took some macrophages, a type of immune cell, and they gave oestradiol to those cells. And what they saw was a reduction in the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so this included interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. And so from these different studies, two general statements can be made, one is which oestrogen seems to be immune improving and progesterone, another type of hormone, and testosterone seems to be immune suppressing. But what is pretty well established is in females who go through menopause, there is a rapid reduction in the levels of oestrogen. And so this now brings us back to this mortality morbidity paradox, which is that women on average appear to be in poorer health than men throughout adult life. And this isn't just limited to Western societies. And so one explanation to explain this paradox could be m menopause and this rapid reduction in estrogen levels. And so there's been various studies that have shown an association between late onset of menopause and a reduction in all causes of morbidity and mortality. And moreover from this, the females who have a later onset of menopause also show lower levels of these inflammatory factors in their plasma, such as interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 6. And this kind of relates back to potentially having this lower amount of inflammaging, which is the chronic inflammation that's associated while well, it is one of the hallmarks of aging. And so I think the impact of hormones beyond just the sex hormones on the hallmarks of aging is something that currently still is pretty much it was pretty unexplored and could have some interesting insights into the aging process. And speaking of hallmarks of aging, that brings us on to nutrient sensing, where high nutrient sensing is associated with more growth and an acceleration of the aging process. So there are many signaling pathways within a cell, but there are some very key signaling pathways that are involved in the response to the levels of nutrients. And so the best way to understand that is by me trying to draw out a diagram. So let's say we have a cell and this is the cell membrane and outside are different nutrients and also uh, signaling molecules such as the insulin growth factor. And this causes an intracellular response that leads to the activation of a protein called mTOR and mTOR promotes growth and being quite simplistic here, it can inhibit autophagy, which is a cellular recycling process whereby, whereby they can reuse damaged proteins. And there's other proteins involved in this process, such as sirtuins and also AMPK. And what you may be familiar with are the different types of interventions that can activate or inhibit these different proteins. And so this includes metformin, which may function through AMPK, and also resveratrol that activates sirtuins, and rapamycin that inhibits mTOR, and also dietary restriction, which prevents overall this signaling pathway. And so many studies performed in mice have looked at different genetic knockouts of different components in these signaling systems and they see different differences in the impact on males and females as to who gets the greater benefits and similarly studies have been done with these different interventions and the 
the impact in males and females seems to differ. So I guess the question is why? And this is also an important question considering the hope to use some of these interventions in the future. And so we can try and understand this by thinking about the hierarchy, hierarchical <laughs> nature of this nutrient signaling pathway. And so this brings us on to the hypothalamic pituitary axes, which I think I was going to do a video on, but I haven't currently. But anyway, to understand this, there's basically factors that regulate the levels of this IGF-1 and other molecules that can promote nutrient signaling. And so one of these is growth hormone. And studies seem to suggest that estradiol, so estrogen, reduces the sensitivity to growth hormone whilst testosterone has the opposite impact. And so it could again be these differences in the sex hormones that can alter how intense the nutrient signaling is, which could therefore alter the rate of the aging. Again, yeah, I think this is, these are just very early studies and that doesn't quite explain why the females have um, the morbidity paradox. Although again, it could come back to the onset of menopause. Just multiple questions at the moment. Now let's move on to some of the asymmetry seen between males and females. And firstly, let's look at the sex chromosomes. So what kind of defines a female or a male? It somewhat comes down to sex chromosomes with males having an X and a Y chromosome and females possessing two X chromosomes. And so the X chromosome in the male comes from its mother. And so whilst females have two X chromosomes, one of the X is typically silenced in each cell. And which one, whether it's the one, the X chromosome from the dad or the mum, that becomes silent is pretty random and it's 50-50 which X is active across a female's body. And this X chromosome in inactivation does leave roughly around 17% of genes partially active. And so because of this partial reactivation, I suppose, it's thought to give females an advantage because they have effectively a somewhat backup copy of genes, which the Y chromosome lacks. But even more interestingly, studies have looked at which chromosome has been inactivated and this ratio seems to get skewed as you age. And so whilst that might be because one X is better than the other and it could be an advantage, the studies have shown that actually centenarians tend to maintain their ratio of 50-50. And so having this capability of having both chromosomes seems to be the fittest strategy. And so besides the inheritance of sex chromosomes, the inheritance of mitochondria, the organelle in your cell, which is the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria in your cells are, are inherited by the egg, so it actually comes from your mother. And mitochondria has its own DNA, has its own set of genes, although it still uses some of the nuclear genes. And so because it comes from the mother, it's thought that maybe it has evolved or been selected to be optimal in females compared to males. I don't really, couldn't really find any evidence about that. If you do, please let me know because it's quite interesting if it does. And other studies seem to show that some mitochondrial mutations are more beneficial in either when they're found in males or females. So again, yeah, there's probably more to be explored there. So let's move on to the last discussion point, which is the gut microbiome. So I've spoken about the gut microbiome before because it is a very interesting topic. And what is interesting about the gut microbiome is that it seems to change in terms of the abundance of the different bacterial species throughout lifespan. And so you can see on this graph just some of the changes, and these changes occur throughout adulthood, but also they seem to fluctuate on a daily cycle. And interestingly, differences in the gut microbiome composition have also been associated with different diseases, and some of these diseases include some of the causes of death that we mentioned earlier on, such as Alzheimer's disease um, and cancer and obesity, and also other diseases as well, such as autism and depression. So besides the gut microbiome composition varying by age and also by diet, studies have also seen, shown differences by gender as well. And so I think that's another area that does still need further exploration. And just for a bit of a bonus, there's also genetic mutations that seem to have potential uh, benefits when present in a female as opposed to a male. 
And as I mentioned in a previous video, when I looked at aging clocks, there was one clock um, that used blood samples to try and determine biological age, and that itself seemed to be influenced by sex. And so clearly there are some key differences in males versus females that have or seem to be underpinning some of these hallmarks of aging. And that's very interesting if we can understand what they are. I just don't think we're there quite yet. But anyway, I hope you've learned something and as always, thanks for listening.